on the We're also going to be putting this onto YouTube after the seminar. Um, so uh, Manuel, would you, would you like to introduce our speaker? Yeah, I'll be brief. I mean, Harry is a grad student at, uh, at Harvard working with Misha Lukin. And uh, personally, I've known Harry for many years, even before he joined uh, Harvard. In fact, Misha asked me to interview him back then. <laughs> I had him on Skype and then I was like, oh, should we take that guy? And I said, Misha, just take him. It's going to be great. And then this turned out to be the right call. So, so Harry had a huge impact on this Rittberg experiment at Harvard uh, doing a lot of the foundational work that resulted in fancy results in the end, but really the hard, hard work and the technical side and, and figuring out things and being creative about uh, yeah, certain you know, implementations and how to do things right, really the, the right way. And uh, so really had a tremendous impact there. And he's now close to finishing, he told me, and might end up as a postdoc at Caltech. You know, and that's one of the reasons why we scheduled the talk. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And I hope this will be helpful to many others. That's all I want to say. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you for the introduction, Manuel. Uh, so yeah, I'm very excited to be here today to be able to share with you some of our recent work coming from uh, our experiment in the Lucan group at Harvard. Can people hear me OK? Uh, I hope that the mic is working. OK. Um, so in our, uh, in our experiment, we're interested in uh, learning how to build quantum systems in the lab. Um, we're imagining devices or quantum devices which are constructed from quantum mechanical building blocks in such a way that these systems can, can take advantage of some of the um, paradigmatic features of quantum systems and quantum physics like entanglement and superposition um, and to use these properties as a basis for, for new types of technology and science. Um, there's of course many wide ranging applications for these types of quantum systems. Um, quantum simulation of course was laid out first by, by Richard Feynman uh, in terms of using these systems as models for understanding more general quantum mechanical principles and, and properties. Um, applications in quantum computing leverage these same types of, of principles for new types of computation and information processing, um, as well as networking and sensing, all based on these quantum mechanical uh, features. From an experimental point of view, there's many ways to build quantum systems. Um, and these can range all the way from using the most microscopic particles, individual atoms or individual ions as the building blocks, or even using macroscopic systems like superconducting circuits, which uh, feature these quantum mechanical properties. And for many of these different platforms, maybe even all of these different platforms, there are two kind of key questions for how to make these devices better and, and uh, hopefully more useful. And they come into the, into the aspect of how well can we control these systems? This includes things like coherence and how well we can manipulate individual particles and how particles interact with each other, as well as uh, how well can we assemble large numbers of, of qubits or building blocks in our system. The motivation here, of course, is that the state vector for a system of n qubits is described by two to the n complex numbers. For n already being larger than 50 or certainly larger than 100, it's just completely impossible to represent these state vectors using classical methods. And so that puts these systems in a really interesting regime where we can't use standard classical methods to understand how they're gonna behave. Um, and that's what is partly being described in this NISC era in which we have intermediate scale systems, let's say 50 or up to a few hundred qubits. Um, and you know we have some uh, reasonable amount of control but not perfect control. And we'd like to understand what these devices can be useful for. Um, we approach these questions from the perspective of neutral atoms. And neutral atoms have perhaps as their most salient feature that they weakly interact. Um, so they weakly interact with each other. That's one important aspect. That's actually in some sense a feature because it means that you can assemble large numbers of atoms in one spot. This is a very simple image of uh, a standard image of a cloud of atoms. Probably there's a few million atoms there in a very small volume. That's possible because the atoms are, are very small and they don't really affect one another too strongly. Um, the weak interactions extend also to weak interactions with the environment, which is, in, again, in another sense, a, a, an advantage. You can have good coherence properties as a result of this, but it makes them hard to control. Um, and so one of the main questions is how well can we develop the, the necessary tools for controlling these atoms at the individual atom level while maintaining this route, this plausible route towards scalability? Um, this is all set in the, in the stage of some of the first work with individual neutral atoms since the early 2000s, 
um, demonstrating that individual atoms can be trapped using, using lasers and, and uh, imaged and uh, manipulated uh, with some degree of single particle control. So that is the, uh, the setting in which we started building our experiment around five and a half years ago, uh, led by Manuel, of course, at the time. And the system that we've built is, is a quantum system that's constructed from individual neutral atoms. So each atom is individually trapped and imaged, as you can see in these types of fluorescence images. The atoms are suspended in, in laser light in a vacuum. So they're extremely well isolated from the rest of the, the environment or the rest of the universe. Um, and there's a very standard set of tools that, that are in place for initializing their quantum state, reading out their state. Uh, and then more recently, um, we think about the atoms as, you know, by default non-interacting, but we can actually switch on interactions uh, by exciting atoms to these highly excited Rydberg states. And that's a crucial ingredient for being able to use this as, as a real many body system. Finally, all the atoms are identical, whether we have one or 50 or several hundred. Um, and so that plays a big part in terms of being able to control many body systems uh, altogether. What I hope to show you over the course of this talk is how we think about this system as a platform for, for both many body physics and quantum information science, and how we've uh, worked on these two different uh, challenging directions of how well we can coherently control our system. Um, that, that includes developing new tools for and new protocols for doing this control, as well as benchmarking it. Um, and then more recently, uh, turning towards how well can we scale up towards larger numbers of atoms in our system. Um, so I hope that this actually sets the outline of my talk already. I'm going to discuss the platform and how we understand it. I'm going to talk about experiments in one dimensional arrays in which we um, have developed new protocols for entangling our system as, uh, and using this to create interesting entangled states that can also be seen as benchmarking how well we can control the system. And finally, I'm going to turn towards um, our most recent experiments in which we're now scaling up towards larger numbers of atoms in two-dimensional arrays and the new types of physics that we can explore in this regime. All right, so we'll get started with the platform. Um, our platform is built around, around the idea of being able to create these atomic arrays in a, in a deterministic way. So we do this by trapping individual atoms in optical tweezers. This will, by the way, be extremely familiar to all of you who know Manuel's work because it's a very uh, common technique with their lab and he uh, started this at Harvard. Um, so we, we work with optical tweezers. Uh, a tweezer can trap a single atom at its focus. This is inside of a vacuum. And we start with a large array of these tweezers. We load them with atoms randomly. This is a very standard and quick loading process. But now the atoms are arranged randomly and we want to move them around to sort them into some programmed geometry. So we do real-time feedback on this where we identify with a, with a fluorescence image where the atoms are located and then sort them and, and move them around to whatever programmed geometry we'd like. This is what it looks like in practice. This is a fluorescence image of our randomly filled tweezer array initially, followed by a fluorescence image a few tens of milliseconds later after we've moved the atoms into our desired uh, arrangement. The whole thing takes a couple hundred milliseconds to load the tweezers and move them around and take these images. Um, and it allows us to create these, you know, whatever, whatever geometry we'd like on this kind of time scale. And this actually sets the time scale on how quickly we can loop, we, we can cycle our experiment. Um, to give you a, a bit more concrete sense of how we do this, so we we when we make our tweezer arrays, we generally start with a single laser and we split it into many lasers to form the tweezers. In 1D, we do this with an acousto-optic deflector. So acousto-optic deflector, we send in an acoustic frequency, and this frequency deflects the laser light by an angle that depends on this frequency. So we can change the frequency and change the angle. Uh, and moreover, we can send multiple frequency components at the same time. This creates multiple optical deflections, and these can then be imaged into our vacuum chamber where they form the tweezers. We collect this light on uh, a CCD camera. So this is a picture just of the tweezers themselves, just the, the bright spots. Um, and now we can think about the, how we load the tweezers. So what we do is we create a cloud of cold atoms in the vicinity of the tweezers. This is a standard magneto-optical trap configuration. This creates a cloud of atoms with, from which we get this stochastic random loading, roughly 50%. Um, and then we shine another set of lasers that cool the atoms and cause them to fluoresce photons. And these fluoresce photons are collected uh, again on a different camera, now a very sensitive EMCCD camera, which allows us to take images like this, which show uh, individual atoms. 
This is then what we do our fast feedback on. So we analyze this image uh, and then we can adjust the frequencies going to our AOD. This moves atoms around and allows us to sort them in this way. Um, so this is how we initialize some kind of register or system of atoms. Um, as I said, the atoms at this stage are weakly interacting with each other. There are a few microns apart. There's no tunneling between tweezers or anything like that. They're really fixed in place. Um, and so they basically don't feel each other's presence at all. And if we want to study many body physics, we have to introduce interactions. And the way we do this is we excite atoms to highly excited Rydberg states. So the principal quantum number for these states, for the ground state, valence electron, it's n equals five. We bump it up to n equals 70. This corresponds to an atomic orbital that goes from some very small sub nanometer scale all the way to a hundreds of nanometers scale uh, radius. So this is an optically excited atom, but it actually has quite long lifetimes uh, in the scale of hundreds of microseconds. And we can treat the transition between ground and Rydberg as a coherent transition. We drive it with a two photon process uh, in our system. We have a blue laser and an infrared laser. In practice, we'll generally just think about it as a two level system, ground state and Rydberg state. We couple it with our lasers. And if we do this on single atoms that are, that are isolated from one another, so they're not close, they're not too close to one another, then we just see very simple Rabi oscillations. Um, and the scale of these Rabi frequencies are a few megahertz. So this is another, another key number. This sets the time scale on which coherent Rydberg dynamics happen. It's all on the microsecond time scale. One quick note I'll make here is that we detect Rydberg atoms uh, by the fact that if we, if we apply a laser pulse and leave an atom in the Rydberg state, then that atom will get lost from our tweezers because it's not trapped. The Rydberg state is not trapped. So atoms that are lost are detected as having been in the Rydberg state. And that's precisely how we form these types of, uh, these types of readout measurements. All right, this is single atoms. Um, if we have multiple atoms, then here's where the interactions start to play a role. Um, so the interactions scale uh, as a Van der Waals potential. It scales inversely with the sixth power of distance between atoms. Um, and the coefficient scales very dramatically with principal quantum number. This is precisely the switching nature of this Rydberg interaction. If n goes from roughly like 5 to roughly 70, then you can get many orders of magnitude increase in the effective strength of interactions just by exciting atoms to these, to these Rydberg states. Um, in practice, this leads to energy shifts that can be in the gigahertz range for atoms at the typical separations we have. So this gigahertz compared to the, the coupling rate, this Rabi frequency, um, these, this, this indicates that the interactions dominate. And this results in a phenomenon called the Rydberg blockade. To give a more concrete picture of what this is, we imagine two atoms that are near each other. And the atoms can either both be in the ground state, they can either one of them be in the Rydberg state, or they can both be in the Rydberg state. And this doubly excited Rydberg state is shifted by the interaction energy. And you can imagine now that if the atoms are close together, then you start driving with your laser field um, but if this coupling is very far off resonance because of this interaction shift, then it effectively uh, doesn't play a role. And you end up with just a direct coupling between ground ground and this symmetrically excited state. Um, so this is the blockade. This gives you the first hint of how this Rydberg interaction can be used to engineer entanglement, since this symmetrically excited state is itself an entangled state. Um, and here I'll say that this state was first prepared in around 2010 uh, with, with some reasonable fidelity, um, we've made significant progress on the coherence coupling between ground and Rydberg states over the last several years. We were able to prepare the state with around 97% fidelity two years ago. Since then, Manuel's group has, has left quite far past us. They're now higher than 99%. I think this is a really cool uh, demonstration of how rapidly coherent control is progressing uh, in, these, in these Rydberg systems. So I think it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of room to improve nonetheless. All right, that's the two atom picture. Um, we generally think about how this plays out now in a many body context by understanding uh, what we describe as the Rydberg Hamiltonian. Here we're imagining an array of atoms, which is each a two level system, ground root state and Rydberg state. These, level, these two level systems are coupled with our global uh, laser field that gives a Rabi frequency and some detuning. Um, this plays out in the Hamiltonian as a drive term. This is a sigma x on each side in the system with strength given by the Rabi frequency omega. A detuning term, which says that if the laser's off resonance, then you move into the rotating frame. And depending on the sign of the laser detuning, 
then either the ground state will be lower in energy or the Rydberg state will be lower in energy. So it, it can be understood as a chemical potential which favors ground atoms or favors Rydberg atoms. And then finally, there's the interaction term, uh, which of course says, now if you have an atom that's excited to the Rydberg state on site I and J, then there's some energy penalty that's associated with the distance between these atoms. One of the most uh, important ways that we have made progress in understanding how this Hamiltonian plays out is to think a lot about the ground state properties of this Hamiltonian for different parameter regimes. Uh, and here we're exploring on the x-axis, the, the detuning, which is our, our chemical potential. Um, and it leads to very simple ground states. If we, uh, whoops, if we give a chemical potential that favors each individual atom preferring to be in its ground state, uh, then that will just be the, the many body configuration will just, will just allow each atom to individually decide it should be in the ground state. We could have a chemical potential that favors Rydberg atoms, in which case now each atom would individually prefer to be in the Rydberg state. But if we start increasing the interactions going up on this y-axis, we end up in this regime where we'd like to excite as many atoms to the Rydberg state as possible, subject to an effective constraint which is to say that atoms can't be excited and too close to one another. Otherwise, uh, they'll get a big energy penalty from that. And so there's a phase that emerges where you have every other atom that, that gets excited to the Rydberg state. They have to order themselves so that they're not touching each other or, or next to each other. And you can imagine with even longer range interactions, now there would be a phase where the Rydberg atoms order in every third site or even every fourth site. Um, this is something we can probe experimentally, of course, by initializing the system uh, where we pump all the atoms into the ground state, we initialize our laser detuning for some negative value, and then we ramp it to a positive value, and we try to enter this phase. Um, this is what that looks like in practice. So here is a, a picture of 13 atoms that we arranged in some, in some uh, line. This is an image of these atoms after we have uh, ramped the detuning to positive values. We now see that every other atom in the system is missing, we highlight those missing atoms as, as red circles, which is how we denote where we identified Rydberg atoms. So this is the, the, Z2, uh, the Z2 ordered phase in which Rydberg atoms are every second site. By bringing atoms closer or further apart, we can change the effective length scale of these interactions. Um, and we can observe this phase where every third atom or every fourth atom are excited. Okay, so this is kind of the, the broad overview how we think about this platform and, uh, and this Hamiltonian. Uh, why don't I uh, pause there for the first time and uh, ask if there are any questions so far? Hi, Harry. Uh, I have a question. Hello. Um, I think earlier you said that the Rydberg atoms can fall out of the trap. Is that a issue, or for when you for the previous slide? Uh, great. So, so when we're doing our coherent dynamics, what we do is we prepare the atoms in the traps in the target arrangement that we want. We very briefly turn off the traps, and while the atoms are in free fall over the course of a few microseconds, that's the duration in which we apply our Rydberg lasers, that, and then we study coherent dynamics in that time interval. Then we turn our traps back on, and the atoms that were left in the ground state will be recaptured by these tweezers, and then they'll make it you know, many milliseconds later to the next image that we take. The atoms that were left in the Rydberg state will just drift away and not be recasted. So they'll, they'll not show up in the next image. I see. OK. All right. So let's move on to, uh, to uh, probing how well we can, we can control the system, in particular, trying to find ways that we can combine our many body understanding of the system to engineer interesting types of states. Um, so here we're going we're gonna to discuss in particular the preparation of entangled states, um, which can be seen both as benchmarks, how well can we control the system and create these exotic states, um, and potentially they can be useful as resources um, in various ways. We're going to talk in particular about so-called GHC states, which are highly entangled states in which every atom in the system is in a superposition of all being in zero or all being in one. Um, and these states are, are known in quantum information to be interesting for various reasons. So one of the, one of the um, reasons is that these states are extremely sensitive to decoherence. Um, by that, I simply mean if any one of the particles in the system projects into, let's say, 0 or 1, it collapses the entire wave function, destroys all entanglement, destroys all phase. Um, so this is maximal sensitive to decoherence because you know, this event can happen on any particle. Um, 
From a different perspective, these states can be understood as resources. So as a resource for quantum error correction, this comes from the fact that there is effectively a kind of redundant encoding of a single bit's worth of information or a single qubit's worth of information. Um, in metrology, the sensitivity, the sensitivity to decoherence can also be understood as a sensitivity to phase perturbations, which may be of interest in metrology, if you want to try to sense these very carefully, um, as well as in communication. And uh, another important aspect of these states is that they're described by a very simple density operator, which is uh, only a couple of non-zero elements. There's two diagonal elements that should be one half each. Um, these are the populations, which say, if I just measure the system, how in the Z basis, let's say, how often do I see the two complementary bit strings that I'm hoping to see? And then there's these two off diagonal elements, which tell me what, what the relative phase is between these parts of the wave function, or indeed, if there is a well-defined relative phase. So it's a simple density operator. Um, what's nice is that it's actually straightforward to measure, as we'll see. And if you can measure it and show that it's larger than a half, this gives you a very simple bound uh, that witnesses um, that the entire system is fully entangled, which is to say we couldn't describe these results um, with a model for our system, which only uh, includes entanglement over a subset of the system. So this all uh, put together makes GHC states a very interesting and natural benchmark for experimental systems. So um, how, can we, how can we see how these states emerge in our system? Well, it really comes from the same many-body understanding that, I was, that I've been describing so far. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna add some new tools. This will turn it into some new protocols for entanglement engineering. We're gonna envision the exact same Hamiltonian we had before, um, and we're actually again gonna draw out the kind of effective phase diagram or the effective lowest energy states. But now we're gonna think very concretely about a particular system size, um, in particular an even number of atoms. Let's say eight atoms. And as before, for negative detuning, the, the lowest energy configuration has all the atoms in the ground state. For positive detuning, we had this Z2 type order. That's, that makes sense in the thermodynamic limit. But for, for a fixed number of atoms, there's a concrete discrete number of ways in which these, these uh, Rydberg excitations can order. So we can get at most half of the system excited to the Rydberg state, subject to this nearest neighbor constraint. Um, and there's, there's two ways that correspond to this perfect anti-ferromagnetic structure. But then there's these other ways in which you still have four out of the eight atoms excited, but they can order in different ways. Um, and we, of course, identify this as this uh, type Z, Z2 or anti-ferromagnetic structure. If we could prepare a, a coherent superposition of these two states, this would be like a GHC state in the sense that it's a superposition of two complementary uh, atomic configurations. So it's nearly degenerate with these other states. How can we actually isolate the states that we want so that we can prepare just this GHC state? The technique here is uh, based on noticing that the target configurations that we want each have a single edge atom in the ground state and a single edge atom in the Rydberg state, whereas all the unwanted configurations have both edge atoms in the Rydberg state. We can take advantage of this by inserting a new tool we now locally address the edge atoms in the system with another laser, which is off resonant and serves to just shift the energy levels around. And the shift in particular gives an energy benefit to having these edge atoms in the ground state. What that means is that uh, these two configurations get some energy benefit. These get no energy benefit that effectively shifts these unwanted states up to be less favored. And this amount of shift is given just by how much light shift we apply on these edge atoms. Um, so this is the qualitative picture, how we can make this GHC state the, the exact ground state that we now can prepare. Um, we can also think more concretely, diagonalize our Hamiltonian. At least we can do this for a small system. Uh, and then notice that there's a unique ground state on the left where we initialize. There's a unique ground state on the right, which is the symmetric superposition of these two target configurations. And now, in principle, there's actually an adiabatic pathway that connects from our initial state to this target GHC state. Okay, in practice, there's an or in, in principle, there's an adiabatic pathway. In practice, we want to do this preparation as quickly as we possibly can, because uh, these states are very sensitive to all kinds of dissipation and, and decoherence. So the faster we can do it, the better. Um, and to optimize this particular trajectory. We use uh, optimal control techniques in collaboration with Simone Montagero and Tommaso Colarco. The idea roughly is we, we kind of 
feed in an initial guess for what a good protocol would be, which is we ramp from negative to positive. And then we numerically simulate this, this trajectory and try to tweak it around to improve the fidelity. And that results in a slightly uh, distorted looking protocol that actually gives us significantly better fidelities than we would have had if we did a very simple, naive idiomatic passage. All right, this is what it looks like. Here's a picture of eight atoms. Here's the two complementary configurations, which we can see coming out of the system when we repeatedly measure. Um, and from collecting the statistics of how often we see these states, this gives us uh, the populations part of our density operator, which gives us one of these two pieces that we need to figure out uh, if we have uh, a full entanglement across the system. All right, that's the, the populations. What about the coherences and, and the relative states? Um, if we have a GHC state of this type, then uh, GHC states, as I said, they're maximally sensitive to decoherence. This can also be understood as a max maximal metrologic sensitivity to applied phase perturbations. Um, we can actually now utilize that uh, by applying precisely the type of phase perturbation to which our GHC state is most sensitive. That for, the, for this antiferromagnetic GHC state, that turns out to be a sigma, X, a sigma Z type field, excuse me, applied alternating to each site in the system. Um, and we do this by using another set of local beams that come in and shift the energy levels around for just the alternating sites in the system. So this results in a, in a light shift on every other atom. This can be understood as an alternating sign for a sigma Z operator on each side. When we apply this, we get relative phase accumulation between the two parts of the, of the GHC wave function. This is given both by the phase accumulated per atom, which is delta times T, but also the number of atoms multiplies in here. And this is precisely this, this n times enhancement that again is the metrologic enhancement for GHC states. Um, we've accumulated this phase. We need to now measure that the phase is actually well-defined and, and therefore we need an observable that is sensitive to the phase. Usually that requires making some kind of basis rotation and then measuring uh, parity turns out to be a very common uh, good observable. That's what we do. So we, after accumulating this phase, we apply a resonant laser pulse on the system. It does something approximately like rotating it into a different basis, like the X basis. And then we measure the parity operator, which is the pro like how many of the atoms are even, or, or sorry, uh, how many of the atoms are uh, one versus zero. If that's an even number or odd, uh, then this is plus one or minus one. We measure this parity as a function of how much phase we accumulated due to this staggered field. Um, and then this gives us the two features we care about. First of all, this should have uh, a frequency that scales inversely with the number, of, or a frequency that scales with the number of entangled particles. And second of all, the amplitude of this gives us a lower bound on how much coherence we had in our GHC state. So now we have all the information needed to make uh, assessments about the fidelity of our GHC states. Um, we can apply this protocol for larger and larger numbers of, of even, uh, or larger and larger systems with even atom number. We've done this all the way up through 20 particles, and we can clearly see uh, a coherence in, in the parity oscillations, even for 20 particles. What's kind of exciting is to look at the, the population measurements for 20 particles, where we, we measure this, uh, we, we prepare our 20 atom GHG state, we repeatedly measure, and then we look at how often we see all of the possible two to the 20 outcomes. So there's two to the 20 bit strings we can see. We basically just see two of them most prominently. Uh, this, these, this configuration and this configuration, these precisely correspond to the complementary bit strings that we're expecting for the 20 qubit GHG state. Um, all right, we combine this population type measurement for each of these system sizes, and we can get a GHC fidelity for each system size. Um, all the way up through 20 particles, we're above this 50% threshold, which allows us to now say that this GHC state, even for 20 particles, is fully entangled. Um, that makes it the largest GHC state that's been prepared to date in any experimental system. Um, I would highlight here that there's been some recent work along similar fronts using superconducting circuits in which they've made 18 qubit GHC states, as well as various types of uh, GHC and uh, other entanglement structures in, in systems of up to 20 uh, trapped atomic ions. All right. Um, so the, the main takeaway that I hope to, to get across here is we uh, have tried to understand how many body uh, interactions work in our system. 
and figure out how we can develop new protocols and new tools uh, for manipulating the system based on this, this many body understanding and coherent control. Um, and I would say here's, there's a caveat, which is when you try to make these, uh, especially exotic entangled states like GHG states in the ground Rydberg manifold, where you have ground Rydberg as your two level system, it's somewhat fundamentally limited by the fact that the Rydberg atoms are not trapped in our tweezers. We can't preserve coherence for that long. All the dynamics that we can really hope to study are on the time scale of microseconds. So one can ask, is there a better way to encode quantum information in these atoms? Um, I'll get to that in, I mean, I'm, I have one slide about this. Maybe I'll pause it again for questions, just since I, I covered a lot already. I, I actually had a quick question. So um, you're saying that the um, coherence between, let's say, your Grand and Rydberg state, if you wanted to use it as a qubit, is fairly limited. Is that then the reason why, essentially, so in these GHZ states, your two, your two states, they have an equal number of spin ups and spin downs. So like your coherence is somehow limited by common mode noise between all the atoms. And that means that it doesn't really affect the relative phase between the two parts of your GHZ state. Is that the correct interpretation? Uh, so, the, so there is maybe a, some amount of common mode noise, but the main issue would be that each atom individually has thermal noise. Um, and that is the main dephasing mechanism for a GHZ state. So unfortunately it doesn't help to have this anti-ferromagnetic structure because okay. it's, it's not making us robust against common mode noise. So what I didn't really explicitly say is the lifetime of these GHC states in terms of the phase, co the phase coherence is like sub-microsecond. Um, and that's just because each atom individually has a thermal dephasing process on this ground Rydberg transition. Got it, thank you. We have one more question. Okay. Yeah, hey Harry, it's Victor. Can Hi. you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, the uh, GHZ states, have you done any sort of tomography to figure out what the, uh, the true state is? I'm assuming it's some mixed state with like majority of it amazingly in this GHZ configuration, but what about the second, the second highest contribution? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. So full tomography is out of the question for, for 20 qubits, that's for sure. We also, I mean, even for small systems in the, in the, rib, in the ground Rydberg encoding, we don't really have the good tools to do full tomography because you can't make arbitrary basis rotations. That's maybe a subtlety. In, in practice, we can try to probe certain other aspects of the density matrix by uh, some of the standard measurements we do. For example, this uh, plot right here, this is the, in principle, this gives us the full information about the diagonal of the density operator. So we can use this, these statistics to try to figure out what states are we most prominently preparing. Turns out most of the states that we're preparing are either the exact state we're trying to prepare or single bit flips away from those. Um, and so we don't know exactly uh, how to understand. It could be that those are present on the diagonals but don't have many coherences if they came from some kind of like dissipation mechanism. Um, I, yeah, I would say we don't yet have a good protocol for probing more aspects of our density operator. All right. Um, so uh, I've talked now about, about probing this coherence and entanglement in, in the ground Rydberg manifold. Um, there are better ways or longer lived ways to encode quantum information in atoms. And so we're gonna switch to now thinking about the atoms as having two different ground state levels. These will be uh, now the effective qubit levels. They'll be nice uh, magnetically insensitive MF equals zero states. There, uh, in rubidium, this is a seven gigahertz transition, a microwave transition. Uh, and we can very routinely drive this using standard microwaves or, or standard Raman laser systems and so on. And the beauty here is that the coherence for these transitions are actually preserved in our tweezers and they can last for a fairly long time. So we measure out to around 50 milliseconds for the, for the T2 of this transition. But in other optical trapping setups, people have seen up to many seconds as the T2 time. So this can, in principle, form a really good long-lived qubit. Um, and now we're only going to use the Rydberg state temporarily when we want to engineer some kind of multi-qubit gate where we rely heavily on the Rydberg interactions. Um, and here, we, we, of course, have to drive this transition. It's the same transition that we've been driving uh, for the previous part of the talk. All right. This 
type of architecture using neutral atom qubits or, or hyperfine qubits and Rydberg states. This has been uh, discussed in the literature since around 2000 when it was proposed how one could use these Rydberg states to mediate universal entangling gates on these hyperfine qubits. Um, this was proposed in 2000. The rough idea is you have two atoms that are in the that are near each other in the blockade regime. And you would apply a pulse on one atom and excite that one atom to the Rydberg state. And then you'd try to apply a pulse on the other atom. And it would only be able to get excited depending on the state of the first atom that you applied to. So this leads to a controlled type operation. It's controlled, you can do controlled not or controlled phase. Um, and in general, uh, it's been demonstrated. The first was in 2010. The fidelities so far have been quite limited to around 80% or so. Um, and, and this review from Safman, uh, Mark Safman, who's one of the pioneers in this neutral atom quantum computing field, highlights some of the main technical difficulties. I would, I would guess, focus on maybe two of the most prominent technical difficulties for schemes like this. So one of them is just that uh, the coherent coupling for single atoms between ground and Rydberg state uh, is relatively hard. And only in the last couple of years have we and other groups gotten much better at learning how to drive these transitions without noise. Or, or without noise that uh, causes decoherence in, in the way that we're measuring. So that's one key aspect is building the right laser systems that allow you to, to drive this coherently. The other is that this scheme is relatively technically challenging for us in that it requires you to be able to very cleanly excite an atom to the Rydberg state, excite the other atoms to the Rydberg state, uh, and so on. And that's, that's kind of tough. Um, what's really cool is that I think there's actually a lot of room for new ideas about how to perform these gates. So we, we recently presented a new protocol which relies only on global coupling of both atoms in the system. Um, so instead of having to address each atom individually, we couple both atoms at the same time and we apply two quick laser pulses. This was brought to us, of course, in collaboration with Hannes Pichler, who I think many of you might know. Uh, we call it affectionately the P gate. P could either stand for phase or for Pichler, depending on, on your mood. Um, and uh, I, I won't actually go into full detail about how this protocol works, but in, in practice, you apply two laser pulses on the system. We can benchmark it by using it to prepare entangled states now within the hyperfine qubit manifold. Uh, and so the entangled state we prepare in particular is, is a two qubit Bell state. This is zero, zero plus one, one. And we can measure the fidelity of our Bell state much in the same way that we measured the fidelity of our GHG states previously and use this as a way to get some kind of uh, estimate on how high fidelity we had for our controlled phase gate operation. So we're at about 97% or 97.5% right now. Um, I think there are some fairly straightforward improvements that will get us into the 99% regime. And then I think there's a few things that uh, you know, are, are technically challenging, but could be done. I, I am optimistic that we could get towards the high 99% uh, range, but certainly it, uh, there's work to be done there. All right. Um, this was just a very quick overview of the hyperfine qubit uh, approach. Um, and I decided not to dwell on it because I do want to make sure I get to uh, our 2D experiments uh, before I end. Um, all right, I, I had already asked questions. Maybe I'll stop briefly and ask uh, for questions about hyperfine qubits. All right, well then let's move on. Um, Okay, so we, we've done experiments with arrays of up to around 50 atoms in 1D. Um, and now we'd like to think about, can we scale towards larger numbers of atoms in 2D? What new physics can we explore? Uh, and, and that's the subject of this last part of my talk. I'll just start and say that all of the, the subject of this section is, is unpublished and much of it is preliminary. So this is more in the spirit of a preview of some of the things we're, we're really working on right at this moment. Um, so we, we, we started with 1D tweezer arrays. For 2D tweezer arrays, um, we, we take a similar a spirit in which we take a single laser and we split it into um, many different beams. This is now done using a spatial light modulator, which gives you a very flexible control over the wavefront of your laser field and allows you to design a, an arbitrary wavefront that propagates into a very clean array of tweezers in some programmable arrangement. So we can create uh, pretty much arbitrary 2D tweezer arrays um, we image them into our vacuum chamber as before. This is now a picture of one of our 2D tweezer arrays. This is 600 optical tweezers. They're fairly uniform. You can, you can make them as homogeneous as you need for, for doing optical trapping of atoms. 
but they're, they're static in place. So the tweezers themselves can't dynamically move around. Of course, we load atoms in, and as usual, we're going to load them randomly. So we need ways to pick atoms up and move them to, to new programmed locations. Um, and we do this by, again, bringing back our acousto-optic deflectors, which have very nice dynamic tunability over their tweezer locations. Um, and we drive these AODs in real time to pick atoms up at various locations uh, and steer them around to drop atoms off at other locations. So this is the very general mechanism for how we're now able to do sorting in 2D. Um, here's a simple image for a randomly loaded array in 2D. This is around 300 atoms loaded out of a 600 tweezer array. Um, and this is what it looks like after one round of, uh, of sorting. Um, so we're trying to fill the upper half of the system you can see that there's a couple defects, but overall, we're, we're doing a pretty good job. Um, if we loop this, then we can start to look at the statistics of how well we're able to prepare these programmed geometries. Um, in practice, we're at around 99% filling. This means that in most cases, we have uh, you know, one or a couple defects, especially in such a large number uh, of atoms. But occasionally, we are able to see these perfect arrays, uh, even for systems up to, to 300 atoms. Um, the, the protocol is extremely flexible, so we can arrange square lattices or honeycomb lattices, uh, triangular, or, or really whatever type of structure we want. I guess to highlight the programmability, we can imagine taking some kind of grid of, of traps and then uh, randomly selecting some subset of them. So this would be a randomly selected subset of three quarters uh, of the traps from a 400 trap site or trap array. We can take this and set this as our target arrangement for what we, how we would like to prepare the atoms. Um, and we can just directly do this. So now here's a single shot image showing that we've prepared roughly all 300 atoms in exactly the right locations that we want. As one last demonstration of this programmability, um, I think uh, we've all been looking for new ways to stay entertained during COVID. So here's some, some of the new atomic video games that we've been playing. All right, so we love Atomic Mario, always looking for new game ideas. Um, this is all about uh, preparing the atoms in some kind of programmable geometry. Now we can think about the many body physics that emerges in these 2D arrays. So we're, we're back to the same Hamiltonian that we've been looking at since the beginning. We have our 2D arrays. We're now illuminating them with, with, uh, with, laser, with the same Rydberg lasers, but the lasers are now spread out in light sheets so they, they can cover the entire 2D array. Um, and we can think about the simplest type of phases that can emerge, like the Z2 phase in 1D, um, but, but now in 2D. So with the nearest neighbor blockade, this is the simplest type of, of geometry to work in. Um, we can imagine, for example, starting with a square lattice. Uh, this is a 13 by 13 system where we have nearest neighbors are in the blockade radius. The diagonal ne nearest neighbors are not. And so if you apply the same type of logic we've been applying from the beginning, you take your detuning to be negative, you ramp it to a positive detuning, and then you try to excite as many atoms as possible subject to the nearest neighbor constraint, then you end up with a checkerboard type phase. So here I'm again highlighting the, the Rydberg atoms in the red circles. Um, this is a, a typical checkerboard ordering that we see. The checkerboard extends over most of the system, but certainly there are often some defects. Here's a defect where we're missing one of the target Rydberg atoms. And so we do this many times over and over again, and we collect statistics about the length scale over which the atoms are correlated in the system. Um, this is a, now a, a typical image showing the correlations as a function of distance between atoms. We see a correlation length that uh, really is at the same scale as the entire system, as the length scale of the system. Um, here's one clear connection between this type of many body simulation in 2D with the type of coherent control we studied in 1D. Um, in 1D, our GHC states were entirely dependent on the fact that we could uh, build correlations over the entire, the entire array in the system. And so those types of correlation lengths that we had map over very cleanly to what are the longest correlation lengths that we can in practice see in our, in our system. Okay, so we have these correlation lengths. Um, we often have defects, but occasionally we have no defects in our checkerboard structure. So we've been starting to track with what probability we have perfect checkerboard ordering over the entire system. Um, we see perfect checkerboards for systems as small as eight by eight, but all the way up to even 15 by 15 arrays, we're able to see perfect checkerboards uh, at least with a small probability. So here's a, here's a picture of a perfect 225 atom checkerboard 
I think this is really exciting to see that there's roughly 113 Rydberg atoms in the system and they're perfectly ordering themselves over the entire array. Uh, so yeah, I guess if you were to compare it to the perspective of if you were to randomly generate bit strings, there's two to the 225 possible bit strings you can see, we're seeing exactly this right bit string with some measurable frequency. So I think that's kind of exciting. Um, other nearest neighbor blockade regimes uh, apply for different types of lattices that we can study. Honeycomb lattice is a very simple example. It's bipartite lattice uh, in the sense that there's a clear sub lattice that you would excite. This is what it looks like when we uh, perform the sweep. Oh, uh, is there a question? Uh, hi, Harry, Ariane here. Um, just a quick question. I don't know if you mentioned this. Is How many shots do you average this data over? These checkerboards you get? So all of the images I'm showing you here are single shot images. This correlation function is probably averaged over several thousand realizations. OK, cool. Um, what What's like the odds that you get the perfect checkerboard when you do a single shot? Is it like every time? Like what's your fidelity, I guess, with preparing these things? Oh, yeah. So that's what this plot is meaning to show. So this is saying that if we repeat this experiment over and over again, with what probability do we see the perfect checkerboard pattern? Um, and so this is saying that for for the fifteen by fifteen, we we're seeing it around ten to the minus with ten to the minus three probability. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So after many thousand shots, then we've we've generally seen it a few times. I see. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. Um, so the honeycomb lattice has this very simple uh, way in which Rydberg atoms can order in a in the Rydberg atoms themselves order in a triangular lattice. If we arrange the atoms themselves in a triangular lattice, then the Rydberg atoms also can order in a triangular superlattice. So this is just a kind of brief survey of some of the different ways in which Rydberg atoms order for this nearest neighbor blockade regime. Um, if we if we start thinking about extending the range of interactions to be beyond nearest neighbor. Um, Things already get interesting in the even in the simple square lattice geometry. So this was worked out uh, uh, by collaborators, uh, theory collaborators at Harvard, um, who've studied the the phase diagram for this Rydberg Hamiltonian on a square lattice as a function of the range over which interactions dominate the, the blockade radius. There's three phases that actually are within our experimental uh, range. The checkerboard phase is what we've been already discussing. Striated and star phase correspond to a regime in which the diagonal nearest neighbors are now strongly penalized. So if the diagonal nearest neighbor is, is fully blockaded, then star ordering turns out to be the, the best. It's kind of a classical closest packing problem. Uh, the star ordering is the best densest packing that you can get that doesn't violate the blockade. The striated turns out to have the same density as star. Um, but the atoms are a little closer to one another, which actually should be unfavorable in general, in the sense that these Rydberg atoms are two sites apart from each other. In this case, most of the excitations are kind of two off by two and off by one apart from each other. So this, in principle, should have the same uh, filling density, but slightly uh, weaker interactions, which means this should generally be preferred. The fact that the striated phase can emerge actually comes from the fact that these in-between sites on the lattice they're blockaded by their diagonal nearest neighbors, but they're actually not strongly blockaded. And so in the presence of the drive field, of the sigma x field, then you actually admix these intermediate atoms with a little bit of Rydberg population. This admixture reduces the energy of these configurations. And that actually is what makes striated favorable over star in this very narrow region of the, of the phase diagram. Um, so there's these different types of orderings. Striated, in principle, has this type of uh, admixture that plays an important role, we can try to map this out experimentally in the same way that we did in 1D. So we initialize for negative detuning, we ramp into these different phases, um, and we can plot, for example, the different uh, parameters that, uh, the order parameters for these different phases. So checkerboard, this is the checkerboard order parameter. This is measuring how much checkerboard type structure we have with what's called the staggered magnetization. This is the order parameter for the striated phase and for the star phase. Um, so what you what you might notice is that the striated phase, uh, in, in the phase diagram, it was supposed to be this very narrow region right here. Of course, we see it extending over a much larger region. This has led to a lot of recent uh, explorations of the question about how the edge of our system uh, interplays with the bulk of our system. And in particular, it can be the case that the edge ordering 
uh, due to our open boundary conditions, are actually incompatible with the type of bulk ordering that would be favored. And this actually can change the, the boundaries of these different phases. This is a, an example of what I mean. Here's a single shot image from deep within the star phase. So it's somewhere over here. Um, the Rydberg atoms, it's a little easier to see if I highlight the lines on which they sit. So this is the entire, uh, over this entire region, they're following this very clean star type order. But it actually extends from one edge of the system to the other, not including the complementary edges. And that's because the edges tend to form striated order, which actually conflicts with the, with the star order. So I, this is, I'm, I, I'm giving you kind of an overview here, but there's, there's a lot of questions to explore in terms of how edges and open boundaries compete with the type of bulk physics that maybe we would be interested in simulating. Um, and there's a lot more to, to explore even with square lattices, but certainly with other types of lattice geometries, which have other properties, frustration and, and others. Um, and I guess one more thing I'll say is that um, in terms of studying these edge effects, it's really important that we have enough atoms in the system. Um, because for a small system, let's say like a five by five system, the boundary of the system uh, has the, the perimeter already has roughly as many atoms as are in the bulk. And so you need to go larger and larger so that the perimeter plays a, a smaller and smaller role as a fraction of the entire behavior of the system. So these are some of the things that we've been learning in our, in our explorations here recently. Um, I'd like to end by making a connection between the same type of many body physics and, and quantum simulation, um, but now connecting it to quantum optimization. And here we're gonna follow roughly the same line of thinking we've been using all along. So here we're, we're programming atoms in some, in some uh, arrangements. Here it's some kind of seemingly random arrangement. Uh, we have diagonal interactions, uh, diagonal blockade and nearest neighbor blockade. And we're gonna think about these atoms now as uh, vertices on a graph. So we'll define a graph based on these atoms where the, there's an edge between nodes on the graph which are within one blockade radius from one another. Um, this is a particular type of graph structure. It's called the unit disk graph, which is defined by some unit radius. In our case, that's the blockade. And when we apply the, the very standard protocol, which we now think of, which is, you know, excite as many atoms to the Rydberg state as possible, subject to this blockade constraint, what we find is that some of these nodes will get excited. Um, and we can understand the excited nodes as what's called an independent set in this graph language. So the independent set is a subset of vertices on our graph subject so, uh, such that no two vertices are actually touching each other with an edge. This is an independent set. Of course, a very natural uh, graph theory question is what is the maximum independent set that we can prepare in such a system? So this is a beautiful connection between our, the Hamiltonian, which favors these maximum independent sets, and combinatorial optimization. And this was worked out uh, again by, by our friend Hannes Kupfer. Okay, so the atom arrangement and the Hamiltonian encodes this optimization problem. The question now becomes how well can we prepare low energy configurations uh, from this Hamiltonian? And there's two protocols that we've been so far exploring. One of the uh, standard protocols is this simple quasi adiabatic passage uh, where we ramp to tuning from negative value to positive value. Um, the other is a more variational type approach so the circuit in our case is, is implemented by applying a sequence of, of resonant laser pulses, but with variational parameters that determine the duration of each laser pulse, as well as the relative phase between these laser pulses. Uh, so these are two different approaches. There's some uh, reason to believe that this QAOA approach, it's very far from the adiabatic regime, but that might actually help it to be more efficient, at least in some limits, for preparing these low energy configurations. So from our perspective, we're really interested in, in pushing each of these and seeing how well do they perform in practice. This is a sample result um, applying the quasi-adiabatic approach. We're doing this on a graph with 179 nodes. And the protocol here is we apply this adiabatic passage uh, many times and we measure the distribution of how often we see independent sets of various sizes. So that's this distribution here. The red line is the exact MIS. This can be calculated using classical methods, at least for small systems or for systems of, of the scale of many hundred nodes. Um, so the red line is the best we can hope to see. We see it with we see this with a small probability, but more generally, we have some distribution that characterizes our outcomes. And one of the questions, I, I, I'll, I'll, the theme here is that there's many open questions. 
One of the questions is, how should we properly characterize our performance? We can look, for example, at the mean of this distribution. The mean is, is, is meaningful in some sense, but it is very heavily weighted by this long tail at low values. Another observable we've been looking at is um, what's called the conditional value at risk. This is essentially the mean of the upper half of the distribution in our case. So that's this orange dotted line. These are two different observables that we've been thinking about and, and tracking. We can try a very simple uh, optimization of the, this quasi-adiabatic protocol. The main parameter here that we can tune is just how quickly we ramp across this transition. And we see that we can generally improve as we go slower, but there's a clear saturation that's, that becomes limited by whatever our many decoherence mechanisms might be, might be playing a role. Um, OK, about QAOA. So this is a little bit more of like a, we, we, we are hoping for the best with some kind of protocol that we don't really know exactly what to do with yet. So the, the protocol again is we apply a sequence of laser pulses and uh, we, the variational parameters in this circuit are the duration of each of these pulses as well as the relative phases between them. So that gives us that for a depth P, which is P pulses, um, there's two P minus one parameters. And so then the question is like wide open, how can we approach trying to optimize these different parameters? Um, here is now the, uh, the scale of, this is the exact MIS. This is what we were able to achieve uh, with our quasi-adiabatic approach. For P equals one, it's very simple because P equals one has only a single parameter. We can do effectively a global search over this parameter space and just directly identify the, the value at which it is maximal. So clearly P equals one is far worse than what we have quasi-adiabatic. It's also a very short laser pulse. It's sub less than hundred nanoseconds compared to a few microseconds that were used for this quasi-adiabatic. Okay, P equals one is the one uh, easy configuration. This, just to give you a sense of scale, it takes around five minutes to make a measurement like this, showing the, the global scan over P equals one. P equals two has uh, three parameters now. And uh, it's actually very borderline possible to do a global scan over this entire parameter space. So we actually did it. I, I had it show up very slowly to indicate that it took 10 hours to take this measurement to be contrasted with five minutes. This is a 3D scan over the, the parameter space where we're looking at different cuts for different values of the, the relative phase. So there's the two times and then the relative phase between them. Um, so there's clearly an interesting structure here. This is very new data and we don't yet know fully what to say. What we can do is identify where we think the, the local or even the absolute maxima are in this, in this uh, 3D scan. We find that the C bar turns out to be better than we had for P equals one. So that's some promising direction that we can improve our, our performance by going to larger depth. Um, but now we really are at the limit. I mean, we, we can't apply a global scan over P equals three or, or anything higher than that. And we expect that the performance should improve, at least ideally, if we go towards larger depth. So how can we think about doing this optimization? Um, well, here we, we are trying to get started using closed loop optimization, in which we, we have some optimization routine. It suggests a set of parameters for the experiment. The experiment runs many measurements with those parameters and returns some figure of merit, which characterizes how well these parameters did. And then hopefully the optimizer can be smart about following tracing and parameter space, perhaps using some gradient descent approach uh, to try to improve the performance. This is one of the first results that we have using this type of approach. This is done on P equals three. So again, there's five parameters. This is the regime where it's out of the question to do a global uh, parameter search or a, a global scan over all the parameters. And what we see is that we're able to, we, we start with, a, with a, a value that's actually pretty similar to what we had for P equals two we are able to see some measurable improvement. Um, and, and that's basically as much as we can say right now. Um, this is a collaboration with Quera Computing to develop these optimizers. And we really don't know yet uh, what the best strategies are for doing this optimization or how well we can do for any given depth. All right, um, so I guess I'll just summarize and say, this is very preliminary. There's lots of questions that we're interested in studying. Um, in terms of how well we can, we can improve the performance of our system and also what the right metrics are to, to characterize it and to compare it even to, to classical methods uh, for solving these types of problems. Um, of course, we're interested in how well these quantum approaches scale with system size um, or scale with, with circuit depth or evolution time and whatnot. So altogether, um, 
I think this is a really cool direction as a test bed for, for some kind of NISC era optimization. All right, uh, that brings me to my summary slide. So uh, I had discussed these experiments exploring coherent control over 1D arrays, our recent uh, unpublished work going towards two-dimensional arrays. And uh, I'll end by just acknowledging the, the awesome team that I get to work with. So here's our experimental team. This is, uh, of course, in the pre-COVID era. This is what our team looks like now in the post-COVID era. Uh, we have uh, a great group of theory collaborators we've been really fortunate to work with. Uh, our PIs, Misha, Marcus, and Vladin. And uh, with all of that, I will end and thank you for your attention. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Uh, I'll open the floor to any questions. Feel free to either raise your hand or type it into the chat box. I'll maybe get us started with one question. So. Um, when you were discussing your 2D arrays, you were saying that edge effect, you, you might maybe are starting to see some edge effects happening when you try to generate some of these more interesting um, geometries, lattice geometries. Do you think you can play some similar games to what you did for the GH GHC states where you have some edge lasers to maybe encourage certain configurations or maybe to remove the effects of the edges or something like that? Yeah, that's a really cool question. I think definitely the answer is yes, that would be possible. Uh, technically, it's a little more challenging in that now you need a large number of edge lasers that can eliminate these atoms. It's, it's certainly possible, and I think that is a really cool direction to explore. Um, you can even kind of continuously tune how strong of an effect the edges have on the system. And maybe there's some interesting physics to study already in that case. Yeah, that's a really cool direction. Thanks. Hello, Harry. Uh, this is Sherry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so I have a general question about the readout. Um, is it possible to read out like individual uh, atoms instead of taking the uh, like the screenshot of everything? So that would be I would say that it is possible, but very non standard at the moment. I think there are some really cool ways that can uh, that people are looking into this. So I think one of the main challenges, as you could imagine, with, with fluorescence readout is that if you shine fluorescent or, or resonant lasers on one atom and it scatters photons, those photons might be collected or absorbed by nearby atoms that are of the same species because they all have the same frequencies. Um, so a couple directions that could be of interest here are using multiple species in the atomic array such that you can avoid this kind of nearest neighbor crosstalk issue when you try to illuminate just one atom. Another idea is to have small ensembles of atoms that are co-arranged co with the individual atoms, where the small ensemble of atoms can be used where you would send a very weak laser pulse through it, and then you could measure transmission through this small ensemble on like an APD. Here, you would arrange it so that this, the transmission of this ensemble depends on the state of the single qubit nearby. And that could be done using Rydberg interactions again. So like if the atoms, if the single atoms in a Rydberg state, it affects the transmission through the small ensemble. This is something that started to be uh, being explored in, in Vlad and Bulatich's group at, at MIT. Um, I think that's yeah, one of the other interesting, exciting directions for um, reading out just single particles. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Harry. This is Junhee. Hi, Junhee. Yeah, so actually, what is currently limiting the, uh, the spell state fidelity of this 97%? Um, OK, so atomic temperature is the main limitation. Or I would say that that is the, the main piece that we know about. Um, so this leads to random, uh, yeah, as, as you know, it leads to random effective Doppler shift on the laser frequency. So when I describe this protocol, we have to pick exactly the right laser detuning for our, oh, maybe I didn't describe this in detail. Essentially, we have to have well good control over the, the frequency of our Rydberg lasers during this controlled phase gate. Um, if the atoms fluctuate in velocity, this leads to a, an effective fluctuation in the laser detuning. This is one of the main limitations. Um, another main limitation is that the Rydberg, la <clears throat> excuse me, in this two-photon excitation scheme with our Rydberg lasers, um, 
we're, we have some admixture of the intermediate state in the excitation scheme. This leads to off resonance scattering. And this is another mechanism that limits here. So if I combine the effects of off resonance scattering and temper temperature, it accounts for almost 2% error. I see. And so, so if we were to eliminate those two known effects, then we'd be kind of firmly above the 99% regime. And I, I would say, I don't yet know what's limiting us beyond that. It could be calibration of things or uh, amplitude, mod amplitude noise on our lasers or things like that. But just to clarify, those numbers are after spam correction, right? That's correct, yeah. I see. So is it actually true that like if you lower atomic temperature, does it also decrease the readout uh, uh, like detection uh, efficiency? Because we are relying on this release and recapture for the Rydberg atom. For hyperfine qubits, you strictly win by, by reducing the atomic temperature. Because hyperfine, when you work with hyperfine qubits, you would always return Rydberg population coherently back to the ground state. You would want every atom to be recaptured with high fidelity. And then we have separate mechanisms for just for reading out the different hyperfine states. Um, so we would like all, yeah, we would like the atoms to be as cold as possible and then resonantly heat out just one of these two hyperfine states to do high fidelity readout. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hi, Harry. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Hi, this is Srijan. I have a couple of general questions. So um, early on in your talk, you mentioned that you don't have access to multiple measurement bases. Um, could you explain the technical reason for this? And a uh, follow-up question on that is, um, does this limit the kinds of phase transitions um, that you can explore in these arrays, uh, as in, in terms of the kinds of operators that you can measure and so on? Okay, yeah. So in terms of what uh, bases we can measure in. So what I mean by that, if, if we're thinking about a ground Rydberg encoding, then uh, yeah, Let, let's imagine you have two atoms that are near each other. Okay, and they're in they're in some state. Maybe you write their down their state in the in the z basis, and you want to now measure their their arrangements in the x basis. The way that you would like to do this ideally is to apply some independent basis rotation to each atom, such that uh, like you would apply a pi half rotation around the the y axis, for example. So we can't do this because when we're rotating the atoms, we're, when we would like to rotate the atoms independently, they're still interacting with each other. So anytime you have population in the in the configuration where both atoms are in the Rydberg state, this is forbidden by blockade. So it, it makes it impossible to do arbitrary independent basis rotations. If you had isolated Rydberg atoms, that's just a two-level system, then we could do arbitrary basis rotations. But that's because our, our dry field is able to uh, rotate this atom independently of anything else. Does that does that answer your first question? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, our, with, with respect to phases, I would say that the types of phases that we can explore are set by the types of the, the Rydberg Hamiltonian that we study or other types of Rydberg interactions that might be of interest. Um, I think certainly the types of observables that we can measure are limited by the fact that we can't do arbitrary basis rotations. So maybe that is one, one uh, way that that comes into play. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you for all the questions. I think we'll leave any further questions and discussions to the Gather Town um, chat afterwards. Um, so thank you all for attending the seminar.